Hi, welcome to Extension Connection. I'm your host, Jerry Buck. On today's show, we'll talk with Extension's early care and education specialist, Dr. Kim, about literacy programs, and we'll discuss a unique concept with M.L. Robinson, gardening from the produce aisle. But first, we're gonna start with Ye Bin. Uh, only six months with Cooperative Extension mm -hmm. uh, in Nevada. Mm -hmm. uh, you bring us uh, expertise in early child development. Mm -hmm. And as I was looking through your portfolio, you have six programs on the ground now and are here to talk with us about one particularly important one. Right. So and that is? Family Storyteller Program. So today I'm here to talk about the Family Storyteller Program, and that is the Family Literacy Initiative that our faculty at the University of Nevada Reno Corporate Extension created like uh, for about 10 years ago. And this was designed to increase young children's language abilities in collaboration with the parents. And when we say collabor collaborating with parents, it means that uh, parents are children's best teachers always, right? So sure. we invite parents and young, both young children to come to our six weekly classes and we teach parents uh, how to read with their children using specific reading uh, technique uh, called uh, interactive reading strategies. Yes, now these programs, Family Storyteller, that was designed by two of our extension faculty mm -hmm. uh, up at UNR Right. And, and that program is now I believe nearly statewide mm -hmm. and you're the one that leads the program, guides the program here. Yeah, in Las Vegas and Henderson, North Las Vegas area. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, as I understand you are right in the middle of needs assessment, trying to determine right. what other needs we have in the in uh -huh. Southern Nevada, in the Vegas Valley, uh -huh. but this program is going uh, full steam yeah. right now. Uh -huh. What is the reason that Family Storyteller is, why is that program so important? Why is why are we putting so much energy in Family Storyteller? I think these days many people know that why it is really important to reading to children at their earlier age, but like especially in Nevada, like according to some of those uh, studies, 2007 reading across the nation studies show that uh, um, Nevada was ranked like 47th um, in the nations uh, for parents, number of parents who uh, read to their preschoolers, which means that that 43 per, only three per, 43 percent of parents read to their preschoolers, and that means there are still other 57 percent of parents who don't read to their preschoolers who are not at reading all. Reading to their children, mm -hmm, which is not really good. Yes, and also like 43. A uh, person of fourth graders in Nevada, uh, their uh, reading achievement level score was uh, below basic level and it was 9%, 43%, and it was 9% higher than uh, national average. So I think those numbers really show why it is really important to bring this program to the community in Las Vegas. Yeah, absolutely, and mm -hmm. of course being a, an affiliate, a part of the university system, uh, we know that literacy is in incredibly important for right. higher education students to be successful, mm -hmm. and apparently it starts at a very young age. Young age right. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, I was reading uh, in preparation for today's conversation mm -hmm. with you that there are one million 12 to 17 year olds in this country who read at the third grade level. Mm -hmm. A mm -hmm. million kids reading at that right. level and 27 million uh -huh. adults who are functionally illiterate. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I mean, this is a, a nationwide problem. It's right. not just a Las Vegas Valley problem. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Sure. But if they can start earlier, then yeah, they can be better at their uh, later life. I mean, studies have shown that like children at earlier age, like especially during those uh, first five years life, they can make some changes in their language abilities. Or uh, they can their uh, language abilities, uh, improve their language abilities during the, the fi first five years of life. And if they can develop those language abilities at earlier age, it really influence their school success later and also their life as adults. Is there any time too soon to be reading to your children when it really doesn't matter? I if you're a less than a year old, uh, is it still helpful then? I think so. Like it, still, they can just try to turn the pages and they can be familiar with the books, reading books. So it really continues, I mean, to their later age, I think. We, we have up on the screen some of the, the six books that, mm -hmm. that you all that you all share with families and mm -hmm. with kids. Why did you choose those six? We've got, um, uh, you have seen my duckling, uh -huh. uh, Peter's chair, 
uh, Good Night Moon. Uh -huh. why, why those particular books? You know, those books are really classic books. You the probably know. Classic, yeah, yes. they're all time favorites, uh -huh. right? So I think parents and children are really enjoying those reading those books together. While they are reading, parents can ask many questions as they want, like what are they, what are they doing, what are they feeling. By asking those questions from parents and by answering those questions, children can improve their language abilities. And those are really good pictures so they can read and they can enjoy those time together they can interact a lot yes yeah what uh, you spoke about vocabulary how much of a vocabulary do you expect a child to have by the time they get into kindergarten uh, do you need thousands of words or what is the what kind of level of competency do you look for you mean regarding the vocabulary yeah of, of children of little kids I mean, like uh, there is a, I mean, specific numbers that children, most of children reach to uh, at that age. Uh -huh. But I think when they start uh, reading earlier, and like when parents help their children to read together, and those language level will be, I mean, increased for sure. So like it will be uh, a few thousand that they need to uh, have like by the time of those five, five years. Yes. But uh, if they start reading together and at earlier age, it will really go up. Those numbers of vocabulary size will be really going up. Yes. Mm -hmm. I see that you've brought along some uh, right. some props for uh -huh. today. How uh -huh. do you use those in the classroom? So those are all those uh, all extender activities that we are providing to the families and children. So they uh, do these activities together. So they take some time to d do these extender activities together. And, and is this kind of recognition activities? Is that what this is about? Or? Uh, this is like kind of craft. Uh, they are all related to the books that we are providing oh, for that day. Sure. So this is from the Good Night Moon. If you read the Good Night Moon, uh -huh. it's about like children saying good night to all those objects in the room, right? And yes. this is one of those objects, the frame. So they make their own frame. They color, they cut, and they put those ribbons around the uh, paper plate. So this is a really easy activity they can enjoy at home with their kids. Too. Keeping mom and dad engaged with their, uh, with their kids. Right. So yes. that's why we created this kind of activity. And of course, they can put those pictures. So they can uh, also they, there is a magnet, so they can put it on the refrigerator yeah. at home, so they can keep it at keep home. Keep playing the game. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. What kind of impacts have we had so far uh, with I the program? I think we don't really have the long-term impacts so far, but I know from our, our short-term impacts that we ask uh, some uh, questions about reading skills to parents before they uh, start taking our classes, like whether they are sitting close when they are reading to kids, or whether they are asking questions while they are reading, or uh, whether they are asking some questions about the story they already read. So we ask those questions to parents. And uh, before they took those questions, it was like a two-point level. It was like one to four-point rating scale, mm -hmm. and they got two-point. Uh, and Coming then, into the program. Yeah, before they took our classes, it was two-point. Oh, and you were able to see then real impacts even after just a six-week program. Yeah, but you after, could see the change. after they took our classes, it went up to three-point level. Very good. So it was quite a good. Yeah, good impact that we are making. I think. Well, well, we know this is a, a very important issue, that it affects families across the valley and across the country. Mm -hmm. We're very glad that you are a part of our faculty. Mm -hmm. And we will be right back with M.L. Robinson, and thank you very kindly. Thank you. Welcome back. I'm here with M.L. Robertson, horticulture specialist uh, from the University of Nevada Cooperative Extension, and he has a, a table full of props for us today to talk about uh, how we might do some gardening from the grocery store. Absolutely. And turn some of the things you'd normally just apparently buy, prepare, and eat into buy, prepare, and grow. Absolutely. How are you going to start this, well, M.L.? Well, you, Where do we start with this discussion? Well, we're... It, we're in the heat of summer. It's too hot to be outside for most people, except oh, yeah. those die-hard desert rats. Uh, I, when, when I can look at the thermometer and say it's only 100 degrees, I'm out there doing something, but most people aren't. Yes. I also don't have air conditioning in my car, so <laughs> I don't, it doesn't bother me. But uh, gardening and for our plants, it's kind of uh, hard. And so um, with the kids off, this is kind of double duty. We can teach kids what food looks like growing. We can grow some of it and maybe produce, such as the sweet potato vine over by you. 
and at the same time have some fun and, and learn how plants grow. And everything that we do should be a learning uh, experience. And so many of our kids in particular, but many of our adults, have no idea where our food comes from. And uh, so something as simple as, um, I try to eat a couple of these a day, these little brown shriveled up things, are dates. They're the real date. And if you bite into it and open it up, inside it's full of sugar and it's really yummy. And delicious. And delicious. And I'm one of these, I have a little uh, uh, dish on the sill and whenever, no one is supposed to throw their date seeds away. You eat the date and you get these little seeds. It almost has a, a walnut look to it, it does, the walnut it? meat yeah. on it. And this is what you would plant yeah, after enjoying the, the, date. the date. You would do this and start your own tape bombs. And what I do is I, I germinate them in a little plastic bag and keep them warm. And there you go. And that's with the little radical root coming out. Isn't that interesting? And uh, that's a baby that date palm. This way? Yeah. So we start here. Absolutely. Eat that. Eat that. Save Plant it. This in uh, looks like a little potting soil, maybe a um, mixture of potting soil. Now you could put it directly in a pot, but if you're doing this during the cool season, you put it in here and you can keep it warm in the house. Uh, when they start to root, uh, the little radical comes out there. Uh, then I take it before the root gets too large, and then I pot it in. These are little pots I use for my palm experiments. And now I have two little palms. Now you can keep this in a container for years if you want. This will, uh, this will become a date palm that you could have out in your D yard. Just like the just big like ones the that others. you see in landscapes throughout the valley. And this is the seedling leaf. Eventually it will be a fan type. We call it a pinnate leaf. Uh -huh. and, um, but palms, one of the great things about palms, you can keep them for years in the same container and they don't really outgrow it much. They don't root bound, get root bound. Well, they bound. get root bound, but they just, they just sit there waiting for better days. That's one of the things, survival techniques of palms. And so they're waiting for a better day. And so you can keep them for years or you can stick them out in the yard and wait about seven to 15 years oh. uh, for them to start to bloom. Now, when you plant them from seed, like many plants other than citrus, you plant the seed, it doesn't mean that it's going to produce a date palm in seven to ten years that will produce anything because it might be a male. Could be a male, sure. And, and if it's a female, it may produce a fruit like this. It probably will f produce a fruit inferior to it. So you're not planting Is it that because these are hybrids? They, because they're cross-pollinated, yes. Okay. Yeah. So it'll but go back to one of the parents, parents more like, be more likely Or a the mixture, parents. yeah. Uh -huh. and, and so, but you can grow your own little date palm. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that um, dates come from palms even. Yes. And so you could be growing your own. It's a great lesson for kids to grow uh, their own uh, uh, plant from the seeds. What a great way to do, as you were saying when we first opened the segment, uh, is that so many people have no idea of where their foods come from and what a great idea to just bring it into the house and grow, and grow it. it. And many of us uh, remember our grandparents, our grandmother in particular, and you have a white one there. Uh, the sweet potatoes? Sweet potatoes come in, and of course they call them yams, but botanically they're not yams. They're related to the morning glory. They're ipameas. Uh, yams or Dioscorea. That no one's going to remember that That's except botanists out there. Change a lot of lives. Knowing change that. a lot of lives, right? Uh -huh. But for for us horticulturists and botanists, that's it's really important. important. These are not yams. I get very upset at Thanksgiving time when they call them candy yams, but uh, no one else does, and they just look at me normally and go, "What's wrong with him?" I've seen that happen. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but uh, these now they these are treated so that they don't sprout readily. So you have to have be patient, put them up on a windowsill, or you can plant them. Now, sometimes they rot, and you have to be careful. This one has a little rotted spot. Would you take that out? I take that you out and let, it, with this? and let it dry before you plant it. And what I did for the one next to you, I, I set it on the windowsill, and it took about three or four months, and it began to sprout. And as soon as it began to sprout, I put it in a container, and I have this, and this will last a long time. Now, this what, would make a gorgeous house plant. It's a great house plant, but what's interesting, and we were talking about this before the show came on, is that you can go to your local um, nursery and you can buy yellow leafed ones and striped leafed ones and purple leafed ones. As ornamentals. As ornamentals, and yet in Hawaii, we had a 
portion of our yard. We took the grass out. We planted nothing but sweet potatoes. And it was this marvelous ground cover. It looked like ivy everywhere, yes. but you could eat it. Yes. And we can plant in uh, with western shade uh, regular sweet potatoes and, and grow some in the yard. So now there, tell me about th this plant, though. You wouldn't plant this one out in the yard in the full sun here. No, not in full sun This here. would be more house plant or shaded? A shaded area. And the, the problem with shaded is that they take a long time to come back each year. Uh, right. The ones at the office are just barely coming back because we had a cool uh, spring and because of the shade keeps it even cooler. Although I have to tell you, I recommend not in full sun, but I've seen them on the strip in full sun and I don't, I'm not sure why they're making it except maybe too much water but they're right next to the road and everything. So there's always an exception, but I would prefer giving them afternoon shade Yes, on there. So I think everything in Nevada is just more afternoon, resilient. and Afternoon shade. Mm -hmm. Now, here's something. Uh, a lot of people may not know this, but uh, pineapples, and of course we have the pineapple underneath, mm -hmm. and this is the top. We can visualize that. And um, they are bromeliad, and we see bromeliads being sold with pretty flowers and pretty leaves, but this is a type of bromeliad. This is a terrestrial, or ground dwelling the pineapple, and this actually could one day produce a pineapple for you in a container like this. Right in the house? Right in the house or on the patio. In fact, I remember my grandmother talking about uh, growing and producing a pineapple in New York. Exactly. <laughs> she could do that on her windowsill. Now this is what you've, you've just harvested this off the top right. of the pineapple you bought in the grocery store. Absolutely, and if you notice, if you look real close here, uh, you've got this little cone-shaped part Yes. And in Hawaii or anywhere they grow uh, pineapples, you twist it off. You don't cut it off. Right. You just twist it in opposite directions. That's what I did a few days ago. And then I would peel this off this like this, here. making the usual mess that I do. Mm -hmm. And if you look really closely, what do I have here? I have little roots. Little, you do. And so you, they always, usually people say, take and cut off and leave a portion of the pineapple, well that rots and molds and sure. stinks. Sure, just opened up a, a can of spot. Mm -hmm. mold rather than worms. But peel this off, expose the roots, and you can peel it quite a bit down, let it dry a little bit, and then uh, put it in a pot like this. A friend of mine uh, gave it to me because I said, don't throw those away, grow them. And sometimes when you go to the grocery store, people will uh, pop these off and they leave them with the pineapples. Right. So, so I just put them in the bag and say, you don't mind if I have these for free? And they say, sure, go ahead. Uh, one thing you might want to look inside, there is a bud in here. Sometimes uh, they cut the bud out. You want to make sure it has a bud it in there. It has not been cut out. It has not been cut out. So look inside and does it have little baby leaves coming? If it does, rather than a hole, then this, this is, is good. good. This Little is a baby good one. leaves tell you you're going to have a plant like this one. And so you'll have a nice green bromeliad, almost free. That is and, wonderful. And, it, and if you pick it up at the counter where they popped them off, it is free. And yes. They don't care if you take them. I always ask. My mother said if it's worth having, ask. And so <laughs> I, I do. It doesn't bother me. That's All great. right. Here's something from Hispanic stores. And a lot of these, and one thing I didn't mention is that you can go to regular grocery stores and find a lot of this, the dates and the sweet potatoes and whatnot. But ethnic, this looks more specialty. Yes. Ethnic, what we like to call ethnic grocery stores, Asian markets, Hispanic markets, you find a lot more fun things. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I enjoy And And for me, I can find things that I grew up with eating. Uh, whereas the regular stores don't always have them. This is called Chiote squash. It's a tropical American squash. In Central America and South America, they actually have them all this big, and um, they just grow up the trees, and they're perennials. And the seed is right in this little niche, uh, this pucker on here. Right in here. Right in there. And what it does, uh, you plant it, and this one, rather than putting it on the windowsill, uh, I put it um, in a container, as this one is. There's two of them in here. And this got a little wind burn. Uh, it was in the greenhouse, and I took it out. But it makes a wonderful little vine. It vines up. Uh, if you have a greenhouse Can or a shady spot. The, the tendrils on this plant, they are so yes. strong. Um, these little curly cues Can right there. <laughs> That's if you hold, they hold that real still, so they, that's a good picture of it. And that's the part really that's going to capture whatever you have it climbing like up. On a pole or branches, and, and like I said, it will actually inundate 
a uh, large tree or shrub in They're New that York. aggressive. They're that aggressive. I've seen them in Costa Rica, and they were, they were just all over everything. In Florida, the same way. So if this was in your house here in Las Vegas, you could put a, a pole or a post in a pot, and this thing would just grow up it, and it, would it? Would you expect yeah, it to sometime or another? Probably not enough light. Not enough sunlight but, for but this. Certainly in the s fall and the spring, you could put it outside in a location. But it might flower? It might flower. And in fact, if you had a little uh, microclimate uh, on the yeah. southeast side of the house, it might even grow and keep the hot, dry air off. That would be really fun to do. And of course, avocados. Uh, Again, when you and I were kids and our grandmothers were uh, uh, doing ha cheap house plants because the economy was bad sure. for them, <laughs> kind of like now, um, they grew their own house plants. If we cut open an avocado, this is a nice soft one. Uh, I, cons I don't consider this really an avocado. No, no offense to the Californians out there. I grew up where Guatemalan and Jamaican avocados Real were grown, avocados, and they huh? were the seeds were bigger than the avocado, <laughs> this oh avocado. But there's a little seed. Uh, you can plant that either in water with toothpicks um, and, and mm -hmm. suspend it over and it'll send its roots down into now, the water. Say, what, tell me what you're doing now with the toothpick part. Well, well you pop this guy out uh -huh. and then you put three toothpicks in it and put it over a little jar of water or a cup of water. You pierce it with toothpicks? With the toothpicks or little nails, little finishing nails. And then you want the water to go about halfway up. You don't want it to set in the water. So this thing would be hanging in the water? No, no. This way? No, no. Let's pop this baby out. Okay. Good point. <laughs> Actually, it's very good. <laughs> it, it looks good on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a sloppy eater. Um, but you, the seed is heavy, so it, when it would fall, it would fall down. And so you put three little, um, thank you, uh, three little pins or on finishing nails or toothpicks in there. Pierce right into Pierce it. Pierce right into it. And then you suspend it over the water so that the bottom part is touching the water all the time. And the roots will grow into it. And, you can, and then it'll send a little shoot up. It'll form a little tree. And you can actually pot it. You could plant this in soil also. But uh, when I was a kid, that's what they always did was put it, and you could see the roots. And again, of course. a great training experience Let for kids. Let the kids see what's happening. To see how this tropical seed sends its roots down and fills that jar with water and then you plant it and you have a little house plant. Uh, again, you could uh, get away because these are Mexican, it's, they're called races, Mexican race, the Guatemalan, the Jamaican race, I don't know why, of uh, um, avocados, but these are the most cold hardy. So you're more apt to uh, be able to could happen survive. Here. And, and some of the chain stores are carrying avocados and papayas and mangoes and even I've been tempted, but I didn't buy them. What a great project. This one is ginger. Ginger, and uh, ginger is great in Asian and, and South Pacific cooking in particular. Uh -huh. Smells it great. It does smell good. Uh, but again, this is what it's grown for. And again, you look and see, do I have a live bud there? And there's, it, it might be turn a, that just a little, little bit, bit more. So we can see you right can see there. The you can see that yeah, bud. There you go. The you bud know, right there. Right there. Perfect. And that tells me it's alive, it has live buds. Sometimes they'll kill the buds. Um, but you can plant that, uh, put it on the surface of some soil, a little soil around, and it'll send up a beautiful ginger plant. Now in this case, would you plant the whole ginger or would you cut it off so I that would, I would plant the whole ginger because this will feed this new sprout. All of this is the nutrient source right. for the new plant. And so you'll have a nice little tropical plant, maybe two feet tall. I keep it in a container. Uh, in a bright window, you, uh, sheltered area outside, uh, uh, with a, you know, part of your herb garden. Sure. And you may not put anybody out of business growing it, but it's a lot of fun. A lot of fun to do. Yeah. And this these are among my favorite. Uh, in some areas of the country, uh, Hawaii and Florida, these can take over. This is taro. Uh, it grows into a plant that's uh, related to the alliocacia and calliocacia, which are elephant ears. And so this is a smaller version of an elephant ear. This is boiled and cooked uh, as a starch, uh, but it also has eyes on it. I see that. This is very potato-like. Yes. 
and, and it's a substitute. It's a tropical substitute. Now, if you're living in Florida, I would be teaching you how to spray and kill this because it takes over the oh, waterways. Really? Yes, yeah, well, at least some of its relatives. But it makes for a nice potted plant if you don't want to eat it. A lot of people would go to a market and see this and, uh, what the heck do I do with this? Well, it's good to eat, but you can also plant it and grow a nice uh, okay, house plant. one minute left here, and I think we've have well, several things we've we got all kinds of things. We have papayas, which are tropical fruits. Uh, they have wonderful seeds inside. And there we go. Well, there we go. There, you can see that. This is the fruit. Fruit. You cut it open. Little black seeds look like ticks, and uh, dry them, plant them, and you get a little tropical tree. Another one you could raise indoors. Raise indoors and possibly grow fruit from it. We have lemons and limes, of course they do well. Mangoes, again a nice tropical tree. Uh, don't play with these if you're allergic to poison ivy or poison oak, especially poison oak, they're related. Same family. Same family. Oh, for crying out. And this is one of my students um, brought me this. These are actually lily bulbs uh, from a Japanese grocery store. That they ML, this is just an incredible array. And of this is just things. the start. I mean, use your imagination. It's a good way to learn about gardening and um, where our food comes from. And our from. kids find out that food, the food really does come from the grocery store. Yes. Buy it there and raise it. Thank you for sharing you this with us today. And thank you for being with us on the Extension Connection.